Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. This is the Barbell Logic Podcast, and today we've got Andy Baker, and uh, we're going to nerd out on programming a little bit. What's up? Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I was just telling you guys, it's my first podcast. So I'm That's a little crazy. Bit, I'm a little that bit actually really surprises me. Cherry Blast. Well, after practical programming, I think I did two, but... I'm not sure that the two that I was on that anybody ever listened or watched to him. So <laughs> what's different about this one? If, if Andy podcasts in a forest and no one learns to hear it, did it really yeah, happen? Did it actually happen? That's right. We may have ruined our reputation by the time this one comes out and no one might listen to this one either. <laughs> so it's, that's why we just do this for ourselves. And then if people want to hear it, yeah. they can hear it. So otherwise, off. that's right. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about, I wanted to geek out on programming. Actually, cool. we're doing some programming talks this afternoon. You and I are along with Dr. Sullivan. Mm. And so for those of you guys that don't know, Andy is a co-author of Practical Programming. And Barbell Prescription. So, and Barbell Prescription, that's Mike. right, which is not just programming, but really an entire theory of training. The manifesto, I think. That's right. What you say, people over 40, which is true, although I think- The master's you, lifter. Yeah, as you get a little further, it, man, it is just like insane, awesome wheelhouse from about 47 to 67. Yeah, we debated over the age mm -hmm. of where to start it. You know, where to, do we say over 50, over 60, over 40? We kind of just went with over 40 because we're thinking, when is the first time that you really have to start modifying programming? Yeah. Definitely in the 40s. Obviously not as much, you know, the guy that's 40 and fit and strong is not going to be modifying nearly as much as the guy that's 65 and brand new, but at the same point, there's modifications that have to happen. Sure. So. so you have to put your lips right on there. Yeah. On this oh, microphone. Okay. Ooh. Here, just, just take it to the edge. There we go. And then All right. We, That's what we do with everything. We take everything to the edge. Yeah. I mean, people that have listened to us know we start telling you that you're old at like 36, 37. Right. That's kind of our, our yeah, thing. It, I felt the difference in my own training when I was about 32, 33. No, me too. That, that was the first time, which is what, you know, you'd always heard your whole life, you know, testosterone starts to drop you know, early thirties. What were the differences? Just recovery between workouts, you know, just doing a heavy volume workout and just feeling like, you know, 48 hours later, I couldn't go back in and train again, mm -hmm. you know, just I'd backing off the volume, having to have more days in between, you know, either high volume or high intensity type sessions, yeah. you know, and just when, how old were you when you started competing in powerlifting and strength sports? Um, early twenties. Yeah. Early to mid twenties. So, so. And I think that's probably why you were more in tune to. I was the same way, right? right? So I won my pro card in Strongman when I was twenty eight ish, somewhere in there. And God, uh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> it is, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and so I remember my recovery ability. Uh, really, even the first several years, the first two or three years that I was a professional strongman, it tanked when I hit thirty one, right. thirty two. I just couldn't. I could do the same stuff. Right. That's exactly. Me I just too. couldn't I could recover do everything from I could do. the stuff. Right. When's yeah. the first day you guys got out of bed and limped and had no no reason for that? Oh, no reason? For me, it wasn't like limp or like injury or anything. It was just, it's hard to describe. It's just a general sense of just kind of, of just fatigue. fatigue. Yeah. yeah. Like if I had to go lift today, I couldn't lift. Like 135 would be a struggle to squat. Right. You know, it would just, everything would feel off and just grinding, no pop. That feeling persisted longer. You know, and so, no you know, pop. you just have to restructure your training. That's, I've I mean, never trained and had any pop. <laughs> <That's correct. laughs> You're the least athletic human on the planet. Bad. <laughs> you don't know what pop feels like. No. Unless it's like popping a hamstring or something. Right. right? right. <laughs> and then you know what it feels like. Yeah. Yeah. Same for me. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time uh, geeking out here on some of your programming. So let, let's talk about what you've been doing since practical mm -hmm. programming. It's really opened up right. a pretty successful business for you. Yep. And tell us a little bit about it. Well, I've got, uh, you know, I've got the gym still, so I'm doing, you know, most of my time is still spent at the gym coaching clients. Which is North Houston. It's North, not in, yeah, just King, nor, just Kingwood, north of Texas, Houston. so yep. about 30 miles north of downtown Houston. So still run the gym full time, but then in addition to that, I've got my website at andybaker.com where I've got, you know, a bunch of articles and stuff, free articles, and then I've got uh, online coaching stuff, downloadable programs, custom program design, so people that I work with kind of on specialty programs, so... You know, really a, a wide range of people. I don't really specialize, although since the barbell prescription came out, kind of associated with just, you know, training older people or whatever. But so I, I got people of all stripes, you sure. know, and I've, I've never wanted to specialize. Like, I've never really wanted to be the guy that trains just older people. And, and I know everybody says that you should, you know, right. from a business perspective, you should carve out your really small niche. It just, to me, it was too boring. I just enjoy working with too many well, types of people. Well, I think your niche is programming. You're, the, right. you're a very right. systematic, logical thinker. But we're niche anyway. <laughs> yeah. 
whether I wanted to or not, I found well, a niche. I mean, you know, it's just, you've got a really good handle on the theory of programming, right? right. I, I think, and you're able to take things that are obviously complicated and make them pretty simple and practical and put them in a program. And then, you know, the programs that you sell, you're able to direct the right demographic often to the right, right. program. So if you're, if you're somebody like we've taught before, as a matter of fact, when we launched, I wanted you. So I called you. <laughs> it was like, hey, you want to work for me? And you're like, I do want to work for you. And you said, can I still sell my programs? I said, nope. <laughs> and you're like, damn it, not going to make a decision. So, but we've never really considered each other competitors right. because you are the guy. So, you know, ours is it's expensive and right. it's very hands on and very kind of white glove. And yours is certainly far less so expensive. And you try to direct people to properly built programs right. for their demographic. Exactly. Is that fair? Yep. Yep. And, you know, not everything can be custom all the time. And I think what we're finding out increasingly is that it doesn't necessarily need to be. You know, I get feedback all the time from people that are having, you know, great success with this program or that program. And they'll say, you know, why did this work for me so well? And I said, because you actually did it. Like you actually followed Consistent. something for 12 to 16 yep. weeks. You didn't change the program up every two or three weeks. So right. maybe this wasn't the most optimal program for you or the perfect program. Everybody's looking for the perfect program, but there's no way to define that. There's sure. no way to know what is optimal right. for you. It's just if you're making reasonable amount of progress and you're not beating yourself up, you're on a good program. Sure. You know, and if you do it for 12 to 16 weeks without interruption, you're probably going to make some progress. Sure you know, on anything reasonable. We'll start with LP. Like if we start to build up this theory behind programming, we can just, we know LP works, right. right? LP works for everybody. Right. So it doesn't matter in the beginning what your age is, what your sex is, what your end goal is. Right. If you want to just be strong to be able to play with your grandkids, or if you want to be a competitive power lifter or a bodybuilder or a triathlon just get triathlete, strong. in the beginning, you're not strong. Right. And the best way to get strong is to keep volume and frequency static right. and add a little bit of weight to the bar every single time till it doesn't work. Right. And so we do that for everybody. So that's not, we have a personalized programming. So the question is, we know the program, novice linear progression works as long as what we found, form is pretty good right. within 95% of correct. And consistency. And you never miss. Right, yeah. That's and that's it. the hardest part. That's the, the hardest, hardest part. That's the hardest part is get people to stay consistent with right. it. Right. So you've got to make sure that you don't miss your workouts. And then you need to be looked at, at least on some routine basis, by a coach. And that right. doesn't mean, again, so you have an option. You have an enormous spectrum there of options. So mm -hmm. on one end of the scale, if you can afford and or hire a coach in your town like you, right. if you're in North Houston, you live in Atascacita, Kingwood, North Houston, Lake Houston area, right. you should be going to see you. Yep. But you ain't cheap. <laughs> I am not cheap. That no, is he's true. He's stingy, but he's, it's expensive to hire him. <laughs> That's right. He, uh, right. Yes. <laughs> he's stingy. Yeah, he's very stingy. But he's expensive <laughs> to hire. Right. Uh, and if you're in Southwest Houston, you should hire Randy Winfrey. That's right. I mean, you should go yep. see these guys. Well, you get 60 miles apart, probably. Yeah, that's what they're like. He's 60 on the miles apart. He's, I'm like on the very north end of Houston, fourth largest city in the country. I'm on the very, very north end. He's on the very, very south end. By the way, end. not fourth largest city in the country, but largest city in the country by land mass. Yes. Did you know that? Yes. yes. So it takes the longest to go from one end of Houston to the other. But it's very easy to drive. Yeah, because you got all the loops. Right. Right. Yeah. So you got the, the beltways yeah. that go around the, the city. So yeah, and then they yeah, and then the spokes that go in. Yep. So it's actually, a, it's a pretty well designed. Well, it's grown out pretty well perfectly. Right. Yeah. And so with the exception of south east because the ocean's there right or yeah. you can call that kind the ocean of, kind of a barrier there <laughs> so yeah it's not exactly a beautiful beach galveston hey, we're, we're proud of our gulf so you know i was born in houston Did yes you know i know that and uh so the first time i ever swam in the ocean was in galveston first time i ever got sunburned to the point of getting inch and a half blisters all over my body the first time oh, no. <laughs> people that moved to from like california and the Carolinas and that, when they move there and the first time they go to Galveston, they cry. Right. <laughs> They're like, I thought this was oh, the yeah, beach. Oh, there is a beach here. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it's Galveston. Yeah. What I remember about going to the beach in Galveston was we drank Cherry 7-Up. Mm -hmm. Remember when Cherry 7-Up came out? Like 1983. So good. Remember that? <laughs> I do. You know what's good in Cherry 7-Up? What's I give up? Seagram's. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have guessed? I have actually never had in that. 1983. I don't think I've ever Seagram had Seven. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. So... Yeah, so yeah, you've got the entire spectrum. So you can hire a coach for 400 or 500 or 600 or if you're in Manhattan, $1,600 a month to work with you on a every single session sort of basis. Or you can, if you don't have a coach in your area, you can hire online coaching or one of our other 
coaches have online coaching where you're actually going to get coached and seen, and that's a couple hundred bucks a month. And if you can't afford that, or you know, then you have options to be able to buy programs. And you also do a Facebook group, right? Yeah, that's part of the online program. It's just Facebook such an easy way to interact with you know members of yeah. So you've got a community that yeah. So there. everybody's getting the same you know the same programming. And then you can go in the Facebook group, and you know everybody's doing the same program. It's a place for me to easily interact, yeah. you know, with them. That's not via email. So sure. you know, I can get on there once a day and you know, go through everybody's questions yep. and look at videos and all that kind of stuff. So it's just such an easy format to what use. What are those questions? What's the big one? Oh, well, they're all program specific. Okay. You know, it depends on what program they're doing. You know, this isn't working for me. This is working for me. I want to add this. How do I incorporate cardio, you know, nutrition stuff? You know, I want to squat an extra day per week. Where do I throw that? And, you know, it's all just kind of that kind of stuff. Has that given you some data to where over time you will tweak those programs? Yeah. From time to time. Right. And I've got a lot of people that are in there that, that don't even follow the programs that I send out. They're doing their own programs or whatever. They just like being in a right. Facebook group and having right. access all the time, sure. you know, so to, uh, you know, kind of a, in a Q&A type format. So, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And the best right. way to learn is, is by coaching people, you know, and I think everything I've put out there, you know, you're talking about being able to kind of distill things down and make it simple for people and all that is, I mean, everything that I write down on paper that goes out to my, what I call my digital audience comes from the gym floor. Right. I mean, I don't know how I would come up with content if I wasn't in the gym all day. Sure. You know, everything, everything comes from conversations with clients and, you know, they, you just have to make it up. What's that? Yeah. 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 You know, or just, you know, repurpose other people's material, you know? And so everything comes from just working with real people and trying to solve real problems, you know? So So you said to me that most of your questions now and most interest is in HLM. Yeah. I think this is probably the thing is with like intermediate program, we have things like the Texas method that are pretty clearly defined in terms of sets and reps and Mm -hmm. HLM gets a little bit more murky. It's, and I've always keep telling people, they say, well, you know, can you send me the HLM program? And it's not a program. It's just, it's an organization. It's a template for training. Within that, there's a lot of variability. I mean, almost an infinite variability when you get into all the different permutations right. of sets, reps, and intensity levels so and that sort of thing. Let's explain for the so, listeners first. Let's, let's start. So HLM stands for heavy, light, medium. Right. Lay out the basic tenets of the template. The basic tenets is you have a day devoted to your heavy training. Now those could be all on one day. So, you know, when you write it down for somebody, the easiest way to write it down is, you know, you've got your heavy squat day. Okay. I also would call that like your high stress squat day. So it could be heavy relative to the sets and reps that you're performing it for. So it's, it's your highest stress day. It could be high volume. It could be high intensity. I usually use a combination of both in that workout. So I try to get a little bit of everything in that workout. It tends to be what, like Three sets of five, four sets of five. For you, what what it would be, typically do you do? I would look at probably a total of anywhere from three to five total sets. Usually it will be, you know, one higher intensity set, you know, anywhere from like, you know, one to one to five reps, kind of all out, yep. you know, heavy top triple, in set. top in set, followed by a series Some of back offs. offsets, okay. you know, right. maybe 5% offset. Which is how yours would differ a little bit from Bill Starr's original, which was right. just, it just the ramped ASIN, up. Yeah, the, so the easiest way, mm-hmm. you know, the uh, Bill Starr's original, everything's, you know, kind of ascending sets of fives. You know, that probably works too. I just typically use a, more of a sets across or sure. top set followed by back off set approach. So if we think about just squats, because it's the easiest way to think about it, then your Monday or your first workout of the week right. is that's the your, heaviest stress that's day. The heaviest stress day, you know, and then you've got your lighter squat day would be in the middle, which is typically your lowest intensity and lowest volume. Right. And then your medium day would be medium, kind of a little bit less volume than the heavy day but a little more than the light day, a little heavier than the light day as yeah, well. So, so you're really managing stress. Right. So even though it's called heavy, light, medium, first thing you think about is this is intensity, right? right? Heavy, light, medium, we're talking about the load on the bar. You're saying it doesn't necessarily mean load. Load right. certainly has something to do sure. with it. Yeah. But it's some combination of volume and intensity. Yeah, I usually... To drive up stress. So it's really high stress, low stress, right. medium stress. Yeah, and I've done it where I've held volume relatively static and just waved intensity. And I've done it where I, usually what I do is kind of wave both volume and intensity. So just as an example, let's just to make it real simple, like Monday would be a heavy five sets of five. So it'd be whatever the heaviest weight you can do that day is. And then Wednesday would be three sets of five at like a 20% offset. So that's quite a big drop in intensity plus dropping two sets off. So much easier. Won't necessarily feel easy, but it's quite a bit less stress. That Wednesday then, day never does feel easy, <laughs> right? It? No matter then, how light. Yeah, me actually in my experience, the medium day is usually easier than the than the uh, right. And so you're more recovered by right. that. Right, and that's yeah. uh, that's where I've gone and just jumping the gun a little bit, but that's where 
with with a lot of athletes like use this with track and field athletes where I really like the medium day is like dynamic effort stuff. Okay. Because you feel good on that day. Like you sure. feel like uh-huh. you've got some pop. Sure. You know, like we were More talking sets, about earlier. Less reps. Right. Fast as you can hit it. Right. Eight and sets so, of two, seven yeah, sets of because three. It'll be, you know, like, so if the, the medium day is four sets or if the light day is three sets of five at say a 20% offset, then the medium day would be like four sets of five at a 10% offset. From the, oh, so from still, the you're day. still keeping your reps at like five ish. On that's, that just, medium that's just an example, but like even say for if, dynamic, no, no. So okay. like with a dynamic effort, what I would do is I would look at that total volume, say 20 reps. Okay. And then divide it up 10 doubles, yes. you know, okay. maybe approximately the same weight though. So yeah, it's going to depend. So, okay. so you know, dynamic effort, it's going to be fast. Well, it depends on the person who you're working with. Like, so I really like heavy, light, medium programs for athletes. Like, I just think that's a really good way to organize training because if you look at most athletes, they have a lot of work to do in the middle of the week you know, sports athletes that are in high school, college or whatever, they usually have the weekends off. So they're able to come in on Monday and hit it pretty hard. They've had at least a day or two off from running and practice, whatever sport they're in. And then, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, they might have to do conditioning drills or sure. sport specific stuff. And you can light and medium squat on sore legs sure, and tired right. legs, but it's harder to hit the, right. you know, the guys are probably not doing anything on Sunday. Right. So when they come in on Monday, that's why Monday's the I, hardest I get day. the most out of them on Monday. Right. That yeah. makes sense. You know, otherwise if you're planning heavy stuff, you know, especially lower body stuff. If you're planning heavy stuff on Wednesday and Friday, well, you know, as well as I do, you're not really in control most of the time when you're working with high school and college athletes. You're not really in control of all the stuff they do outside the sure. gym. If we look at the stress recovery adaptation cycle mm-hmm. for a novice, it's very clean and very simple, right? Monday is the stressor. Right. Tuesday is the recovery by right. the time after, you know, as soon as the workout's over. And Wednesday shows that there is an adaptation right. because we are able to keep going up the weight on the bar, not just there's once. A, there's an adaptation. But three times a week for weeks and weeks and weeks right. and weeks. As soon as it becomes intermediate, it gets a little more fuzzy. Right. Right? It's not as clean. It's never certainly. as clean. And that's the thing I wish we had in practical programming. I wish we had like a two or three page section on like the gray area. Yeah, the mess. Between all of it. Because sure. I think the dividing lines are not nearly as clean as we would like They're them not. to be. They can't be. Right. right. And we've talked about it. Actually, Especially I'm, between I wanna... intermediate and advanced. Okay. I, like I wanna... uh, there's, there's almost... No, yeah, you can't. There's it's almost not a difference. No, but I actually think there's novice yeah. and everything else. Right. I'm kind of of the same stripe where yeah. it's there's weekly and then there's like, you know, every two weeks versus once a month. Yeah. I mean, and then it's like, so where do you cut it off? And yeah, you don't know. You know right? So, right. That's where it has to be individual. Okay, right. So hang on. So I'm going to build there because we've got to get. So when you get to heavy light medium, what is the quantifiable metric or metrics that you use to show that? We are making progress on a week by week basis. Performance on the heavy day. Okay, That's it. That's Monday. the only thing I look at. Monday's performance. Right. So Monday, the weight continues to go up or the volume continues to go up right. and the weight stays the same. Right. We can look at tonnage. We know that there's Some more metric. stress. Add a rep, add a set. Okay. Stress add, goes up right. every single Monday. Right. And as long as they can continue to hit their prescribed sets and reps on Monday, right. week after week after week and the stress continues to go up week after week after week, then you can say, quantifiably, we've made progress. Right. Okay. Good. Perfect. You know, and then typically what I do is, you know, when we lay it out for somebody just on paper, I'll show, you know, everything, all the heavy stuff on Monday, all the light stuff on Wednesday, all the medium stuff on Friday. But that's usually not how I do it. I usually like to have one heavy lift per day. Right. You know, so it's like, you know, heavy, light, medium for the squat, but then for your pressing movements, it might be, you know, light, heavy, medium or, or sure. whatever. So that we, we You're organize not heavy, heavy, heavy. Right. Right. Cause no, I mean, all your slots it just are doesn't not work heavy. very well. Yeah. And it's not efficient. The light day is too easy. Right. I know for me personally, I can't gear up to go in there and just do a bunch of light lifts that sure. I know I'm going to make. It's like, almost I, not enough stress. I, to right. I want, homeostasis I want at all. one, at least one lift that I really have to focus on. Sure. So it's like, okay, heavy bench day. Like I got to go in today. I got to kill it on the bench. But then I got light squats and power cleans or something like But it's, then do you still try to make Monday as the heaviest stress day? Across the board? It usually is because of the squats. Because automatically, because the squat is the hardest lift. Right. Then if there's a heavy squat, a medium. A lot of times the bench winds up being on Monday too, just because sure. the organizations for the pressing, usually it makes sense where it's heavy bench and then we overhead on Wednesday. Right. And then on Friday, Friday. would be a medium bench, which for me, if I can, I don't like to introduce too much complexity in terms of, you know, so when we get an intermediate trainee and we introduce them to heavy, light, medium programming, you know, minimum effective dose of complexity. Sure. Right. So the first thing we're changing is sets and reps. Absolutely. And then variation in exercise. Yes. And so, but I might make small changes, you know, something like moving from 
you know, a bench press to a close grip bench press sure. is not the, exactly a, a pretty tiny change. Right. If you're not athletic enough to handle that sure. or, or, or pausing <laughs> it for a two count. Yes. You know, so sure. for something like that, I will make the medium day loads harder. And I tell my lifters that all the time. It's like there's little things we can do. We don't have to just put load on the bar. We That's have right. a light day or a medium day. There's things we can do to make this lift harder. One, we can pause it. You right. know, one, we can change our grip or we can change our stance, yep. you know, or we can just move it faster. And that's where I started doing the dynamic stuff. It's like, you know, the lifter says, well, this four sets of five bench feels a little bit easy. We'll move it faster, you know, explode in every single rep. And then let's shorten the rest periods down too. Yep. you know, so it's the same amount of overall volume and load, but you're making that exercise a little bit more stressful. Sure. So, you know, people want to train hard. I do. I don't want, yep. I don't like to go in and just have a light day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A complete light day. Right. Yeah. It makes sense. Since you use this heavy light media mostly for athletes, I would assume there's more variance in the pulling exercises yeah. before anything else, right? You're doing yeah. a deadlift and then you might be doing a power clean. You might be doing a rack pull or an RDL or like what yeah, are the things so that you tend to use there? If you work with like a, like a sport athlete and especially one that is going to go play, you know, say college ball or whatever, and they're going to be like in track and field or football or whatever. Even if you're not the biggest fan of the Olympic lifts or the, you know, the variance, they're going to have to do those when they get there. Sure. You want to prepare those kids as much as you can to get to their freshman year, their strength and conditioning program and, right. you know, be able to power clean some weight. So the Olympic variants really, really fall neatly into the heavy light medium program really, really well. So, you know, it's very easy to have your heavy deadlift day as just deadlift. heavy is the deadlift, right? Heavy is a deadlift. That's light. Pretty, that's pretty easy. Light is a power snap, snatch, snatch and medium is a power, power clean. clean. That's, right. that's, I mean, it's, yeah, real, it's simple. real, real simple. You can organize it however you want. You know, you can also just do if you have one or the other. So you have a guy that just really sucks at the power snatch and just have him power clean twice, you know, once heavier, once lighter, sure. you know, so there's, there's a lot of ways to do that, God, that for a general. That just makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's super easy to do that. And when you're doing that too, the benefit of doing that is that even though it's a light pulling day and you're going to power snatch, you're power snatching maximally. Right. I'm still probably doing singles. Right. On the power snatch. Yeah, time as heavy as they can, but it's right. still. Not still light, that much weight. You know, it's yep. still, it's concentric relative. Only. Yeah. There's very little eccentric movement there. And the same with the power. Doesn't clean, make you sore. You know, my favorite method usually for those types of kids at that intermediate level is really nothing but singles. And I'll do them timed, you know, every 30 seconds to a minute, pull sure. a single. You know, there's no form deterioration. We can use heavier weights, you know, builds good work capacity. You can get in a lot of volume with just a bunch of singles in a real short period of time. Yep. So that's usually how I use that. With a more general strength trainee, yeah, I was going to say, so the middle-aged like, person who's not going to Olympic lift. Right. So I will either do, you know, if they're not going to Olympic lift at all, then the light deadlift day is usually going to be some sort of back movement that does not involve the low back. Because, you know, I just haven't had luck with... The so rows? Rows, you know, even if they have to be chest supported or something like that. It depends mm -hmm. on who you're working with. The low back is the area where you have to be careful with, because if you beat people's low backs up, it affects everything else. Sure. It affects their squatting, and pressing, whatever. So, you know, chins, you know, if they're, you know, that's always good midweek type break. And then the heavy day is still usually going to be the deadlift or a rack pull. So I usually don't ever deadlift and rack pull in the same week. I've not had good success doing that personally or with people. So it'll be the rack pull or the deadlift on the heavy day. The uh, medium day would be like, you know, just a little bit lighter deadlifts, but maybe with a little bit more volume, two or three right. sets of five. Or my personal favorite is just stiff legs. I've always had the best carryover to my deadlifts. I like yeah. deficits. Yeah, deficits is a similar well. sort of thing, right? So you're actually, if you start to look at the way we can increase stress, with exercise selection, right. by changing the exercise selection, I have a theory that we do one of two things when we choose an exercise variant of the main lift. We can increase stress by increasing range of motion, mm -hmm. which essentially increases time under tension. Right. So it's essentially a function of volume. Right. A deficit deadlift compared to a deadlift is more work, right. more time under tension, and essentially yep. more volume even with the same set and right. rep scheme. Yeah. I would agree. Or we do the other end of the spectrum. We shorten the range of motion, higher intensity, like a rack pull. Right. Right. Shorter range of motion, less time under tension. And we still can drive up the stress because we're driving up the stress with intensity there. Right. So, so those end up being a function of intensity. So press lockouts, rack pulls, floor presses, board presses, right. things like that. And almost all of those fit pretty neatly into one or the other. Right. right? And yeah, so, you do. know, pause squat. It's more time under tension. A tempo squat, it's more time under tension. And then you just, you also have to go, and my experience has been too, that anything that you're doing dead stop out of the rack pretty much qualifies as a heavy day sure, movement. Sure, it's hard. Because th right. those so types hard. of things, people underestimate 
the difficulty of doing, say, like dead stop. Yeah, there's no dead, rebound. Dead stop, pause, anything. Bench, benches. You know, right. starting right. with the bar. You know, an inch above your chest where you have no, oh, you have no tension built up in your, you know, in your pack, and you know, doing five to ten heavy singles like that. You know, yep. it's just it's it is brutal. It's hard to recover from, almost to the point where it takes more than it gives back. You know, in sure. certain in certain you be circumstances, careful how to manage the stress. You know, there. but so that kind of stuff definitely qualifies as heavy work, and and then you just have to go a little bit with experience of just having had done a lot of that stuff yourself. You know, what is your recovery like? I don't know if you've had the experience with rack pulls where. You know, I've gone in, you know, and loaded up, you know, 600 plus on a rack pull and pulled it for reps. And then like you go try it a week later and like I can't break 405 off the pins. Yeah. So <laughs> I actually you know? have found that my lifters, either a rack pull or a deficit deadlift crushes them, but not both. Right. right. So like Santana can deficit deadlift all day, every day. Like the guy's just it's weird. It just doesn't no. affect him. But if he rack pulls, he's wrecked for a while, a week. Right. So is he naturally pretty fast off the floor well, and he has no, trouble locking he's out? Not, right. So that's what you would think. It's just not the case. Now, no, he pulls with pretty standard speed or pretty consistent speed throughout the lift. So that is what you would think. If somebody's really good off the floor, then maybe their deficit deadlift is just not that we would But that yeah. just doesn't seem to be the case. I'm specifically looking at the amount of fatigue or performance decline we get from doing that lift. You know, how long does it take to recover from that period? Right. And for Santana, a rack pull kills him and a deficit deadlift doesn't. For me, it's the exact opposite. Right. I can do an 800-pound rack pull, and the next day, I'm like, oh, I'm fine. Right now, that rack pull is also usually with straps because right. it's really, really heavy. Right. right. So there's something about really, really heavy in your hands. Oh, I, I agree 100%. Wrecks you. I, don't, yeah. I don't know why or, or what does it. But a deficit deadlift, dude. <laughs> Deficit deadlift, the bottom of my rectors down at my ass, just, oh, they're just killing me, right? So hard. My, to my guess your... is it would have something to do with build as well. Yeah. You know, sure. height yeah, and anthropometry. Sense, right. Yeah, that's it's true. Certain lifts are going to be, course. you know, and there's difference between a two-inch deficit and a four-inch deficit. Right. I never you know? use more so than a two-inch deficit. I never deficit. do either. I just, I, just I don't think two it carries mass, over. So mine is, you know, not even three, three inches. Quarters. Yeah. It's that's what I do. Inch, inch and, and a half. half. Right. That's Isn't that weird, yeah. though? Yeah. You and I have never talked about that ever. Right. And we've just programmed for decades, and we found out that it carries over. But Why? Well, because the back angle doesn't change right. a lot in a one and a half, one inch, one and a half inch right. deficit. When you go to a four inch deficit, it's a squat it doesn't the floor. look like a deadlift right. anymore. It, it doesn't it's, carry it's, over. It's really dangerous too, honestly, I think, because of the position it puts you in, you have to drop your hips so low. The bar's way out in front of the midfoot right. when it comes off, but you're able or, to generate a lot of leg if you drive. Keep your hips high, it's your hips leg. are way above it's your stiff shoulders. Leg. Yeah, yeah right? it turns into a stiff leg. That's right. Yeah, yeah. so. Which is not a bad lift either. Right. It's not a bad movement pattern. We had a lot of these conversations several years ago when we were doing practical programming where we had never really talked and we started talking about programming. And it was like, we reached a lot of the same conclusions independently. Not just me and him, but like just everybody having this conversation with Sully. You've got all these guys who've been programming for years and you start realizing like, oh, we all do the same thing. Right. And you didn't do it for any actual like scientific data-based reason. Yeah. You just did it because over time, experience had showed that this is what works. Right. This is what our people respond to. This is what we respond to in our own training. And and uh, that's why you can't buy experience, right? No. You can't just look at, well, the data just says this. Experience actually matters. It has to, right? The data is only useful when it articulates something that has already been observed in practice, is sure. what I think. The way that I look at the, kind of the data, rather than the other way around, not looking at the data first and then trying to replicate programming or methodology that comes from the data. You've it's got a right. terrible way to do it. Sure. Because the data shows all kinds of stuff that are irrelevant. Right. I mean, we've gone over this, I'm sure you guys too, in the podcast of, you know, these crazy, ridiculous programs that you would never put somebody on, but, you know, in a lab environment, show some increase in sense. hypertrophy. Sure, right. But that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't Correct. mean that one set of 20 leg extensions three times a week is a good strength training protocol. Right. It just happened to work for six weeks on a group of untrained people. Sure. You know, so data is good when it can articulate something that we kind of already have observed in training, but don't necessarily have a great explanation as to why it happens. Sure. You know, we just, but we know that it does because we've seen it happen enough times. Yeah, or we can actually utilize the scientific method and we go, okay, this is what I think works. I'm going to make this hypothesis. We're, you know, we're going to debate it and right. we're going to drink whiskey and we're going right. to talk about it and then we're going to lay it out and then we're going to test it. Right. And then we're going to see what the data tells us. Right. Because now we're actually testing this right. hypothesis and uh, it works pretty well. It's just so there. hard. It's so hard with this type of stuff to get any type of good you know, scientific method, you know, it's just, it's, it's hard to control because it's, it's human behavior, right. you know, even There's in a lab no placebo squat. Right. It's just, it's just so, well, it's you so can't difficult. control non-productive stressors as a coach, right. but right. I can't control if one of my client's girlfriend breaks up with him on Thursday right. night. Right. Or if he got the flu, ran, ran a fever, right. ran a car accident, whatever, like any of those things. And so 
to actually derive data, even if you take everybody out of their environment and put them in an actual lab and make them sleep there for six right. weeks. So, man, they pick up some cold. Right. right. Still all like, kinds of stuff that yeah, introduces so in there. So. It's just whatever. And so you just can't. So we do the best we can. And we take thousands and thousands of lifters that we've coached over decades of years right. between you and me and ben Sully and all these guys. And when you start to look at it and you go, well, how did we come up with the idea that completely separate from each right. other, this is the thing that worked? It's right? just something about just intuition. Sure. And it goes back like with the volume and intensity type debate of, you know, what drives progression better, volume and intensity. And the answer is both. Of course. And we've all observed people where, you know, this is what happened with bodybuilding back in the days. What's his name? Mike Menser, Meltzer, yep. the, the Menser. high intensity guy. Yep. So, you know, he got these great gains and supposedly from this, you know, one set to failure and all this kind of stuff. But if you look, when all that stuff started, those guys had been training for decades on extremely high volume. He was already sure. crazy strong. Well, their body. They had adapted to the volume. And, right. then, and so and when had you, not adapted to the intensity. When you pull the volume away and it introduce them in. Can we still use the word supercompensation or well, something? I mean, it's fine. What word is replaced? That, I, I understand what that you're saying. That thing that looks like supercompensation right, is actually supercompensation. The word we used to use. So, but when you have a lifter that's been training with a ton of volume for a long time and you pull that volume back, let them recover a little bit from not, you know, doing these crazy, you know, the Arnold type routines, which they is what all those guys are doing. realize the adaptation yes, is that's what, what occurs. Exactly. They realize and then the they adaptation. Go, they go, oh, well, it's higher intensity that works. And it's like, no, no, no. It's higher intensity on the back end of really high volume for a prolonged period of time. Sure, right. And people see that all the time. So they, you get these guys that are maybe not training with a lot of volume. They're training, you know, maybe they're just squatting once a week up to, you know, one top heavy set that works for a good long while. And then they kind of stagnate. Well, then they go to a three day a week squatting program. Yeah, with start volume, volume they, back they, in. Yeah. And then they start progressing and they go, Oh, volume's the answer. And then, you know, a year later they've stagnated again. They go, well, right. volume suck. And it's, so it's like volume goes up and then it has to come down. And then it goes up and then it comes down. And it's only that repeating process of building volume, pulling it back, building well, volume, this, pulling it back. It's this idea we were talking That's about, about stress sensitivity versus resistance, right? Like I get the more times I'm exposed to the same stress, right. I build up a resistance to that stress. It, re mm. it, re it requires a bigger bolus of that stress every single time, every single progressive time I do it in order to elicit an adaptive response. And at some point, if I just push intensity, 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 at some point, intensity stops working. Right. right. But the same occurs with volume. It sure. Volume, volume, volume. And so that's why we're constantly trying to manage the two. Hambrick and I were talking about this the other day. Think about what happens, and we were talking about the stress recovery adaptation cycle for an actual novice when it feels clean, right? When right. it feels like it's the, you know, each session is the stressor, then you've got your recovery, and then the next session shows the adaptation occurs, right? right? Well, actually, at the end of novice LP, that's obviously not what's going no, on. No, right? not at like all. there's clearly fatigue present. Clearly, yeah. From Monday to Wednesday. Right. Let's say the last three weeks, last three weeks of actual LP, mm -hmm. the guy still is able to put more weight on the bar and make progress. Right. But complete recovery is not even no. close to occurring. No. Right. Now, here's the question Why does LP actually stop working at that point? Is it. We is have a, it? We have a theory. Wait a minute. I have a theory. Don't don't poison the well. Okay. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go poison the well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's like, save my ass. You're right. Okay. So is it because you're not able to add weight to the bar, therefore you're not able to induce enough stress to elicit an adaptation, to drive adaptation and strength, or is it because by the end of LP, there's enough fatigue present that you're not able to recover from the heavier and heavier progressive loads so you can't make progress. Right. I. It's both, I think. I think it's both. I, I think do. it's both. I think it's both, and I tend to think it's, you know, is it 50-50? I don't think so. I, think oh, I don't it's, think we can know. I, yeah, I, I, would, I would lean towards it's more of the latter, of the fatigue being okay. present, but right. it's definitely both. I think it's, it's different it's, for the different lifts. Yeah. Well, that's probably so, true. So that's well. probably true. So our constraints yeah. in LP are three sets of five. Right. Yeah, let's say you, can, you can't change the volume, right? Right. We're sticking with three sets of five. And so for the presses, he can't put more weight on the bar. But it's not recovery with the press. So I immediately, on questions like that, I immediately start thinking of a client okay. or, or a person. Right, right. I'm training. What do I do in that situation? Do I immediately increase volume on that guy? You have to change, no. the, you, you change no. the rep scheme. I do. But, but maybe the volume volume change. Volume must go up, but not today. So what do you do? So let's take the squat. My mind automatically goes to the squat because of kind of who we are and what well, we do. That, that's so, why I said press. because No, I think you're right. You're right. It's, it's different. The recovery is what puts the brakes on the squat at the end right. of LP, I, I'm pretty sure. Okay. But here's the question. On Friday, 
let's say that this person squats 335 for three sets of five on Friday and it either damn near kills him. Let's say he misses. Let's say he goes five, four, three. Mm -hmm. And it's the end of LP, basically. What so, do you do with that? So guy? I have, and this is in practical programming, but I have a little thing that I've done for a long time with people like that. And it lasts about a month. Okay. You know, it's not a long term solution. And so, but I look at how the guy is failing. Is he failing like the first? set that so on three sets of five is he going is he coming in and going and only getting three four, or four, four. four three or is he going five five two okay okay mm -hmm. how is he, is he just running out of gas yep. by that third set or is he coming in just not able yep. to do it yeah. sure if i'm watching his first set and it's a pretty good clean set of five then i'll just keep having him in squat the one top set of five and he can still run an lp on that and then just do a back off yep. set or two yep. at we'll a slightly reduced weight. He can do a five RM three times a week, adding weight. So still a linear progression. He just can't do 15 reps of that. Correct. That is definitely the case with your better genetically gifted lifters, your right. younger guys, like your, I go back to the track and field and stuff, the shot put guys and stuff like that, that are super explosive. And th that's how they're going to fail. Like sure. they're going to be able to do it, but they're not going to be able to carry that out for 15 reps. Sure. If they're coming in and their workout on Monday is, you know, four, four, three, or, you know, three, three, two, or something like that, you know, if it's a miserable failure, it's probably time to just change programming rather than trying right. to, you know, I don't believe that people should try to just beat themselves at the end of LP and milk out every last single pound out of the bar because it makes whatever you transition to after that too hard to it's, sure that the transition to, to the next right. thing has got to be a reduction in stress for right. the first several weeks. It has to be, right. it has to be your first, you don't call it a deload. But it has to be a right. deload. That's what well, it is. And, and also, the, there's the mental side of that, too. If you've pushed somebody really, really hard on sure, LP, it's, it's super hard. The last Those last three, four weeks suck. It's way harder than anything you'll do as an intermediate or an advanced. That's why you can't take them from that on Friday. Of like the, the For the three or four weeks, they've done the hardest three sets of five of their right. life. And on Monday, go, time to start Texas Method, five right. sets of five, really heavy. Right. Well, I never do that anyway. No, like, nobody would. Yeah, and you wouldn't do that. No. And, and so that's where, you know, but going back to the LP... If they're coming in and not getting that first set, then you can do the same thing, kind of a little bit of a reduction in, in load by just having them do, you know, run out like three triples. That doesn't last as long. Mm. That maybe is like two or three weeks. Okay, so we do the so, same thing. So wait, let's build out the actual theory for this. So you, you're giving the practical, which I agree with all of it, but I think we have to understand like, why does that thing work? And so for us, let's talk about the squat. If the problem with the squat is that the guy's not able to recover, right? then it would make sense, theoretically, that we could just let him recover longer. Right. And he would come up and be able to go back up. And that actually might work a little bit. Right. As a matter of fact, we do that often because what we'll do is we'll actually, I will often move to a Wednesday lighter squat day right. before I put them on sort of a Texas method, like volume light heavy. Right. Uh, or a heavy light medium. Or so what I'll do is I'll just make Wednesday a 20% back off day. Right. Friday and Monday still look identical. Yeah. Three sets of five, three sets of five, and they still go up. And that works for two or three weeks. And right. And do it, right? But at some point at the end of LP, the lifter isn't able to go up in weight and he's not able to recover enough from what he's already done because by the time he did and all of that fatigue mm. dissipates, mm -hmm. yeah, detraining training has right. occurred. Yeah, yeah. And that's why we have to start manipulating volume right. and intensity together to play with stress so that the lifter is able to make progress over the long yeah, term. Yeah, because you can't just take more days off. Because you that, can't just you take just, more days off. You train. train. You That's right. train. Yeah. Right. You have to train often enough and heavy enough in a way that allows them to still progress and you sure. can't have continual degradation in performance. So then the next step is what you just said. I am of the opinion, and I also would say that this is definitely a, an opinion of mine. I think I can back up the other stuff with decent, sort of, sort of at least logic and reason, if not data. On this one, I would say, here's what I do. Because the adaptation we're trying to get is force production. Right. People forget that. The object of the I game know, is weight on the bar. And it's not, man, I hate the fact that when we say the word intensity, what we're talking about often or what people think we're talking about is percentage of one rep max. Right. But right. I understand as you organize programming, I use programming that uses percentages because how else do you actually lay it you, out? You, there's no other people. way to represent. Right. That's what, like when we did practical programming, Rip yeah, was very against do? percentages. But you start laying out programs. There's no way to show relative. You can't relativity. just give weight. Yeah, you can't say yeah, somebody that reads practical right. programs is not going to be like, well, Andy said this guy does 340, and so what would that be for me? Right, that's right. too hard to do. But absolute intensity, magnitude of the, the weight, actual, the actual weight on the bar. 
actually matters. It actually matters. Obviously, right? So if you take a guy who squats 600 pounds, can that guy make progress, drive a strength adaptation with a 67% squat, which is a 405 squat? And I would say yes. Yes. We talked about that on the phone the other day. do a 405 squat. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But Sybil, my 82 year old lady that deadlifts 145 for a set of four, 67 percent, which is about 96 is pounds, is a waste. Right. It's a waste. And, it's taking out the trash. Said, That's exactly it's taking right. out the trash. That's right. You said a really good thing to me the other day. You said nursing homes are full of people doing 75 percent intensity sit to stands. Right. And they don't get better. Right. Why don't they get better? Well, because their 75 percent isn't heavy at all. Right. But somebody who squats 600 pounds is. Right. And so because what we're trying to drive up progressively is stress. Right. And three sets of five at 405 or four sets of six or six sets of three, that is a lot of stress. Right. Well, Sybil can walk in and deadlift 95 pounds for 60. Right. Yeah. You just do it all day. What, you want me to do this till tomorrow? That's fine. It's not enough stress to drive adaptation for her. Her threshold, I know for Sybil, I've actually been thinking about it since we've been talking oh, about it. Yes. So her top, her, her best one. deadlift is 145 for a set of four. She missed her fifth. She has to pull over 125. Nope, 135. Is that right? 125 okay. doesn't do sh- for her. Be, yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, I tried I it the other it. day. I was like, let's do 125. You know, she was like, you know, she plays organ at, and it was Easter and she had family in and she, so I'm so it, tired. It she doesn't pulled. even really preserve adaptation no, that well. That's like right. Like if you take older I people, don't even think it that's, maintains. That's why when we did barbell prescription, I was insistent that intensity dependent was in the text because they are. If you, that's right. That's why when we deload, if you look at the way we deload on, in the barbell prescription, it, especially for the yeah. older, you know, the older they get, you look at the prescription for like a midweek deload. It's really low volume, but the weight oh, yeah. doesn't come down that much. That's it's right. It's like deload with like one triple. Why? Because we know that volume is the thing that the older population has a harder time recovering Absolutely. from. Yes. They can do it. Now, again, science would say that the older you are, the more female you are, the more vegan you are, the less testosterone right. you are, <laughs> that you the are a non-responder, the, the more hambrick you are. Right. It's, uh, you need more work, more work. Right. A bigger bolus of work to be able to get an adaptive response. That's what science says. Only all of our experience says that's not actually what happens. That's not actually what happens in my experience. That at what all. we yeah. see is that the more female you are, the older you are, less protein synthesis you have, you actually have to go heavier. It's why we take women to five sets of three. It's why you go heavier and you can't get away from the fact that as intensity goes up, volume has to come down a little it bit. It has to at some you point. You can't do a light day with a guy at 95% of his of what he did on Monday right. and do Three or four sets of five. Okay, so that means, so that now we've come full circle on this theory, which means what I know you do often and what I do most of the time, what you do most of the time, is that at the end of LP, when I can't make a intensity increase for three sets of five, I start trading off volume for intensity. Right. And I start going to three sets of three, you know, multiple sets of three, maybe a top set of five and back offs or top set of three and back offs or whatever. Now, here's the thing. I want to be very, very transparent about this. I don't know. I certainly know that tonnage doesn't go up during that period. If I calculate tonnage, their tonnage on Friday at three sets of five, and then I take them to three sets of three, if you do the calculations, tonnage does not go up. Yeah, it goes down. That's right. Calculated one rep max also probably doesn't go up. I don't know. It may stay the same or whatever. But here's the thing. I think... That there's something important that happens when the absolute intensity of the bar goes up sure. for a little while, right? Now, this is a very short period for most people, and of course, that's who knows what that means. Yeah, is that's a four to six week yeah, period. Yeah, it's, it's about a month. It's a, or so. yeah, where, where we're going triples, and we might even go singles. We might go five singles across. Well, five singles across is not very much right. tonnage. No, but boy, it's hard. Something happens to that well, person they, that they've is, never been exposed to that stress right. it's How a brand new stress how do you know stress? what two reps left in the tank is if you would never done right. bone on bone rp10 right. one rep max three rep max five rep max and i think and you think because we talk about it all the time yep. that something virtuous occurs that there's sure. actually virtue here and this is right. something that i think a lot of people forget the physiological change that occurs is not the only thing that's important here 100% God, man, there's an emotional, social, confidence building thing that occurs in this month at the end of LP when I drive up the intensity. And you know what? If you put it in all the equations, I don't know if you actually 
theoretically got stronger. You know how I know you got stronger? Because the weight on the bar continues to go up. Right. And then when I can't anymore, and that happens in about right. a month. Right. That's right. Then we start bringing the volume in but, to drive the stress up. And a guy that at that level, it's like, I don't care what your estimated 1RM is off of your four best four sets of five. I want to see you with four plates on your back. That's right. That's and right. I want to make you drop it down into the hole and stand back up with That's it. That's right. Because not knowing something if happens can, to that guy. The thing is, as a coach, again, we're not just getting paid to make people stronger. Because let's be honest, you take a guy and you get him under the bar for, you know, six, eight weeks, 12 weeks. You're going to basically have given him what he needs already for his health. That's right. You know what I mean? It, sure. I mean, you really are. And it, let's, right. I mean, just daily functional sure. strength. But the changes that occur when you make yourself stronger than you need to be, as a coach, if you don't let people do that, you're robbing them of something. You're robbing That's them right. of an experience that they need to have that makes you not just a better lifter and stronger and able to produce more force or whatever, but makes you a stronger person. That's right. You know, it's the only thing that we can do really as, you know, non-athletes to push our bodies. That's right. What else are we going to do? We're not going to go fight in a cage or, sure, right. you know, whatever we're going to, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's the right. only realistically thing that we can do to really walk that line of really challenging ourselves sure. physically is load ourselves under yeah. the bar. The last yeah. meritocracy. I right? think we uh, went to the training to put them through all of their paces. Right. Right. You know, you can do heavy, heavy triples all the time. Doesn't mean that you can do your single. Well, they, you, they it doesn't mean they, they need to, they need to learn it. that there's a skill. We've talked about this of before. Course. It's not just a physiological adaptation to be able to squat a heavy one RM. You have to know how to stay under the bar and not quit on it. That's and right. Feel that moving up a centimeter at a time That's right. and know that it's still moving That's up. That's right. You know, That's what we're talking about. We're not saying like, look, you should grind reps three or four times a week no. for six months. That's crazy. But if you don't know how to grind, you're never going to set a true one rep max. You can't. What are you there for? That's right. What are we actually trying to What are you refine? there for? It's like, if you're a cage fighter, do you want to go in there and kick everybody's ass? Right. Do you want to be John Jones and go fight a bunch of amateurs yeah. and just go, <laughs> or do you want to go, I mean, he's- uh, Cosmo uh, Kramer. You, you want to go in there and- the little kids. Right. You know? <laughs> That's yeah. the best right. episode. I mean, I, for me, per, I'm just talking my own personal experience. You know, I'm as strong as I need to be for my health. Yep. You know, for me, right. it's about the challenge of, I want to get under a bar on occasion that I'm not sure if I can squat sure. it. Almost everybody we train who actually buys into this and gets through it, right? So Brett McKay's in the room. I can remember Brett got to the point where his squat was like, you know, upper mid upper 300s, not quite 400, right? right? His deadlift is close to 500. The guy's like strong enough for anything that life's right. going to throw. Yes. Like he's strong enough at that point. And I actually thought when I went to him, I would be like, okay, what do you want to do? Like, yeah, I just want to maintain my strength and let's go do like mud runs and I'll do mud runs right. in my life and stuff like that. And I was like, you want to keep getting stronger or do you want to just, you know, would you want to maintain strength and whatever? And he was like, I want to keep getting stronger. Yeah. Stronger than you need to be. Stronger than you have to be. Right. You can't get it otherwise. You don't understand otherwise. Right. Right. So like you can't have that conversation. Right. In week three. No, no, no. no. Because they haven't been refined by it yet. Oh, yeah, we had, yeah. We had Sanders yeah, on. And, Frank you know, Sanders. So when he first hit his, I don't know what it was 315 squat or something i think i told him i you know he was early to mid 60s when he's he 65 years yeah, old and so i'm that. like you know he's like so what's next and i'm like i don't know man like 315 is pretty strong yeah, like right. you know do we he's right. like i don't get 405 you know and now he's he hit 480 in the meet the other day you know or 475 or whatever yeah. it was and you know he's got two torn hamstrings in the process right you know and it's like is that your fault? Uh, no, it's just it's just a consequence of a guy that's, you know, I'm not, my job is not to tell you what you should do. It's yeah, if sure. you ask my help, I'll tell you how to well, do Sanders it. Sanders is a, you know, a Navy SEAL. And yeah, so, exactly. You, know, you have a, to know your people. And yeah. that's the thing is he's, there is no way that Frank Sanders is going to be satisfied to stop at 480. That's right. Like 500 is, is coming. That's right. Like whatever's got to happen, 500's right. coming. Yep. And, you know, no matter how many hamstrings a guy has to go through. To get there, he's gonna he's gonna get to five hundred. I don't recommend that to people. No, of course but, not. That's be the world's just, you know. first hamstring transplant. Well, but you wouldn't <laughs> right. recommend you wouldn't recommend playing in the NFL for health either. Right, right. And that's yeah. the thing that people have to understand that what we do in the beginning is we get general people who are weak and unhealthy, right, strong and healthy, right, and then they get to choose. Yeah, they exactly. have the power to now choose. Do you just want to stay strong and healthy and like just maintain that, or right? Do you want to be competitive? Right. Because as soon as you decide you're competitive, and Frank Sanders is a competitive. <laughs> right. Yep. That, yeah. I mean, that guy's as competitive as it gets. If he never does a meet, 
He's still competitive. Oh, of course he is. You know, it's not about yeah. when we say that. It's not yeah, about remember, what when, to when we interviewed him, he talked about for years and years, he would just, he would run and run. He'd run these like long trail runs. And he's like, I hated it. Right. Well, why'd you do it? Like, because I had to just, I was chasing after the PR. Right. He wasn't competitive with other people. He was competitive only with himself. He was like, man, I don't know. I just, I just, I wanted to run a 10 K in this, in this much time for me. Not because anybody else knew. It's like the corniest saying in the world, but it's the Apollo Creed speech from Rocky IV. And it's like, without some war to fight, the warrior may as well be dead. Yep, sure. It's what they call foreshadowing. And it's right. like, <laughs> yeah, Foreshadow. yeah, and then, yeah, yeah, epic foreshadowing. And then Drago killed him. <laughs> right. Sorry, spoiler if you haven't seen Rocky IV. <laughs> 30, 30, 30 year old. 35 years. I mean, it's corny as hell, but that, I mean, it is kind of the truth in a way. Sure. And it's what we, it's kind of what like, are you gonna it's, do? it's what we have. Yeah, we talk about know? this all the time. Even from a business perspective with our clients, you have clients when they sign up for this, there's almost no commitment, right? And then most of them fall in love with this stuff. Right. It's for the first six months through novice LP. Right. It's puppy love. Right. Right. It ain't, it, right. nope. And then some guys turn out like Frank Sanders mm -hmm. or Brett or Santana or you or me who like, I don't even know what I would do if I couldn't do it. No. Right. Like you start to become like, this is what I do. Right. Right. And so, and for a business guys, I want a bunch of clients like that because right. those, those guys don't leave. Yeah, right. They stay because they're in and they, they don't right. get bored and go do hot yoga. I yeah. don't want people who are going to get bored and go do hot right. yoga. Yeah. Right. I've yeah. never been that bored. Sometimes I do naked hot yoga. I think about they, what my body might look like naked in hot yoga and it, it does not sound anything about it. It doesn't sound like an appealing picture to me. <laughs> it would smell like bacon grease in there. Uh, so that's an hour of this. We could do four. Yeah, we, we, we got to do more of these for sure. That's fine. We'll do more, but no, we'll, you know, we'll wrap this one up. Tell everybody where they can find you first. If you're looking for a local coaching at my gym, kingwoodstrength.com. If you want to find all my stuff online, it's andybaker.com. Right. Start with the blog from there. Tons of free articles on there. Look at the programs, you know, if you want to after that. So. Well, thanks for doing this, man. Yeah, thanks for being on the show.